after watching all of this the last couple of days, weeks, the physicians in the Kremlin might be, have gone to bed last night thinking, the jig is up. They need a new plan. Get out a new map. Get out a new whiteboard. Now that their role in the disinformation plot has been exposed, their guy's not only been indicted, but also has spilled the beans on his connection with all of them. But they must have been pretty happy when they woke up this morning and learned that their allies, their friends in the United States Congress, whether witting or unwitting, don't seem to care. And they are sticking with the plan. Joining me now is Congressman Jasmine Crockett, Oversight Committee member and Democrat of Texas, who made a pretty good point on Twitter today when she said, quote, seems like we should spend less time talking about Hunter's junk and more time digging into, oh, say, Russia's potential actual infiltration of the Republican Party. Exactly. So let me start here with the obvious, because you've been working with these committee members. You've been in these meetings it seems to me, and I just outlined this, like James Comer and his group of top-notch investigators here are just continuing to plow forward with an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. I mean, I guess it's embarrassing for them to shut it down now. It's embarrassing to keep going. What is going on here, and what do you think is, is going to happen? Listen, you've got to laugh to keep from crying. Um, Jen, you know, we know what Putin just did with Alex Navalny, right? Like, we mm -hmm. know that these are real serious threats. And mm -hmm. what I have said before that has really offended so many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle is that we not only are supposed to swear to fight those enemies that are domestic but also foreign— but it is weird when it seems like a lot of the domestic enemies are right here serving in the house with us. And that's what we have, because everyone should be ashamed. Everyone should be appalled that they have been peddling Russian propaganda. And if we go back a few months, if we go back to the summer, you will recall that James Comer was going on and on and on about his star witness, who turned out to be a Chinese asset. So we've got one of our enemies when we talk about Russia. We got one of our enemies, when we talk about China, all we need is Iran to jump in this thing and it will be a full trifecta that the Republican Party has decided that they wanted to embrace. And it is absolutely shameful and it is also dangerous, not just for our elections, but for our security in this country. I had almost, but not quite, forgotten about the last asset of a foreign authoritarian government that they had pushed forward as their star witness. Thank you for the reminder to everybody. Now, you're one of your colleagues um, on the Oversight Committee, Dan Goldman, who's outspoken just as you are, used some of the strongest language to date about this entire episode. He said, quote, House Republicans have been acting as an agent or an asset of Russian intelligence for Vladimir Putin. What do you think? I agree. I mean, they simply are Putin's puppets at this point, right? We know that Putin definitely doesn't want us to support Ukraine. And so what's happened? They have foiled every single attempt that has been made in a bipartisan way to make sure that we can do our part in a supplemental. They don't want it to happen. And it's all because Trump says he doesn't want it to happen. And the fact that Navalny was killed the week after Trump said he doesn't really care what Putin does to our NATO allies if they don't pay up. That is a problem. And the fact that people are still considering putting this man back into the White House is absolutely scary. I need people to take this seriously. You are not voting for your best friend or who you think has the coolest new gold shoes. You are voting for someone to actually run our country, keep us safe, as well as protect and look out for democracy abroad. I mean, the gold shoes as being cool is quite generous. But yes, your point is very well taken about what is at stake here. I did want to ask you, I mean, this, this star witness, um, who may be a Russian asset, and uh, I mean, he, he, he's been pushing this disinformation for years, and it's been echoed for years. Do you have any, there's a lot to dig yeah. in here, a lot we still don't know, but are there any red flags for you here about how long it took DOJ to indict him? I mean, how many years? I mean, you know, I always take issue with it, right? I think, you know, it took too long to finally start trying to indict Donald Trump in the first place, right? Like, I mean, he had the first part of the season and now it's the find out part of the season, right? I mean, we know that it has taken a long time for the chickens to come home to roost in general. But what I will say is that uh, when it comes down to it, if people don't start to say DOJ... 
do your job, do it fast, do it efficiently, then we are going to be in a world of hurt. We know specifically on this particular issue that um, uh, it was Giuliani. Giuliani actually went over to Ukraine. He started trying to chase down whether or not this was true or not. And Giuliani came back and said he could not find anything to support these allegations. And so what did they do? They said they didn't want to hear from Giuliani. We tried in oversight. We said, hey, why don't y'all bring Giuliani in? Because he already investigated this and determined that it was false. So why it took the DOJ so much more time after there had already been this kind of preliminary investigation is still very confusing to me. And I get that they want to make sure that they don't misstep on really big issues like this. But honestly, if they would have waited any longer, we could have been looking at an impeached president for no reason. No other reason that that is what Vladimir Putin wants. He does not have funds uh, to pay off the judgment. Uh, then we will seek, uh, you know, judgment enforcement mechanisms in court. And we will ask the judge to seize his assets. New York Attorney General Letitia James is telling Donald Trump in that clip, in no uncertain terms, pay up. The ex-president is on the hook for roughly half a billion dollars after his civil fraud case. And every day... The fine goes unpaid. Trump owes an extra $87,500 in interest. Oof. And in addition to the fraud judgment, Trump still owes writer E. Jean Carroll $83 million for defamation. I asked one of Carroll's attorneys what happens if he doesn't pay. We can start taking steps to actually enforce the judgment, um, which means going to the court and asking for an order for us to start attaching assets. I mean, this money has to be paid. Uh, and if, he, if he's not able to secure a bond or pay the full amount to the court, then we will, then we will take steps to make sure that the judgment's enforced. As A.G. James told ABC News, quote, if you want something done, give it to a woman. And it seems like these women are going to do what is necessary to get Trump to pay for what he owes. Neil Katyal served as acting Solicitor General of the United States, where he argued dozens of cases before the Supreme Court, and he joins me now. So, Neil, I know timeline wise, Trump has a couple more weeks, not much time. We're talking about early March here to kind of pay what he owes in these cases. What would the process of seizing Trump's assets, if it came to that, of course, actually look like? When would it happen? How would A.G. James or Robbie Caplet or Sean Crowley or whomever, how would they go about doing it? Yeah. So first of all, Donald Trump is facing, I think, about 550 or so million dollars when you add up the two judgments in the interest rate uh, that has to be paid at 9 percent. Um, so assuming he doesn't pay that within the next couple of weeks, either to the court or through a bond, and we can talk about what those are in a minute, but assuming he doesn't do that, then Attorney General James can go into court, as she says. She says she'll seek judgment enforcement mechanisms in court. So that would be basically saying to the judge, look, he owes $450 million and as a result of this judgment. He's not paying it. So we're going to force you, the court, to seize these properties, sell them, and give us the money. Um, and similarly, the process for Gene Carroll would work in a very similar way. I think the complication is that I think it's very unlikely that we'll get to that stage mm. because one way or another, Trump will get the money uh, to be put up to be put up um, to avoid that forced seizure of his assets. So that's interesting, because the question is really then, how will he get the money? Like, how will Trump get this money? Because, of course, um, the ruling says he cannot seek loans from New York lenders. He can, of course, go out of state. Um, is, is that how, what he has to do in order to in order to pay this up? So he's got basically two options. One is he pays the judgment himself, either through his cash assets mm -hmm. um, or through assets that he can sell and liquidate. But that's about, you know, whatever, 530 to 550 million dollars. That's going to be very tough for him to do in a short period of time. So in reality, he's going to have to get what's called a bond. And a bond means that he's not going to have to pay the full amount right away. Often bonds are only you put 10 percent down and then the 90 percent is lended to you and you've got to have collateral. Now, 10 percent is the rate for someone with a normal track record of paying their debts and you know being a responsible business person. Obviously, the allegations here make that pretty tough. 
Um, and in addition to the 10%, you also have to pay bond fees, which are here going to be about $20 million to whoever writes a bond. And you point out, Jen, you're absolutely right. The judge in this case banned Donald Trump from making dealings with any financial institution licensed in New York, which means any bank and the like. So thousands of institutions are out for him to get this bond. Um, but there may be other people out there, you know, maybe a hedge fund or maybe mm. an individual, maybe, you know, Elon Musk or Putin or someone else <laughs> who's willing to loan him the money, because even though Trump's not good for it, um, he's known as a grifter. And if you lend him money, you probably get some benefit in return. Can he get the money from, I mean, I know you sort of, that was a joke, although no reason, it's crazy things are happening this week, so we should explore all options. I mean, could Putin, could, could an authoritarian leader or government get, lend him this money? Is that legal? Yeah, well, I, I, assume, I, I assume Putin could because it'd be a Russian sanction issue. Well, of course, not Putin, but the, the Saudis, but, others? But, Right. So someone else could. There's no legal prohibition against someone else paying the judgment of someone else. Um, and particularly when you have a grifter like Trump, that may be an attractive investment for someone, even though they know Trump's not good for the 550 million. Um, he may be good in other ways. Um, and so this is something really to watch. And it is really striking that we've had, you know, weak, salacious testimony in Georgia about Fawny Willis and possibly getting, you know, vacation trips for, you know, 50 yeah. bucks or $1,000 or whatever. And yet we're talking about this massive amount of debt that, that this presidential candidate may owe. That seems a far more serious concern to be worrying about. I mean, the plot of Homeland is thickening. Um, you know, Trump, no surprise to you or me or probably anyone watching that he weighed in on this last night. He just happened, of course, this is the part that's a little questionable, to have a copy of the Eighth Amendment on him. So take a listen. Would you give up one of your properties to, well, to it, settle this? Up, look, we have, you know, I wrote this out because it was so, it was so great. I just looked at it. People call up. All of your friends, the lawyers call up. They say, it's the most egregious punishment anybody's ever seen. Tim Scott knows that. He sees it. The Eighth Amendment. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. That's the Eighth Amendment. So I think it's fair to say he's not exactly a constitutional expert. You are in the minute we have left here, Neil. Is this excessive? Uh, no, not even close. Uh, so, I mean, Donald Trump, I think, knows a lot about cruel and unusual punishment, having doled it out when he was president. But on this one, he's absolutely wrong. Um, this is a fine well within New York's tradition, the federal tradition and the state tradition. Um, you know, the reason why it's so large is because he committed such a large crime. And, you know, that will be the answer in court. And I don't expect Trump to win. Turns out when you do a crime, you're going to be there are going to be consequences when our legal system is working well. And it did in this case. Neil Katziel, thank you, as always, for explaining all the things to all of us. Tonight, we are still waiting for the Supreme Court to rule on two pretty big cases. There's the effort to disqualify Donald Trump from appearing on the ballot in Colorado, based, of course, on the 14th Amendment and Trump's incitement of an insurrection in 2020. And the court is also considering Trump's claim that he is immune from being prosecuted in the federal elections case brought by special counsel Jack Smith. But while we continue to watch and wait for action on those major big cases, we did get one really satisfying ruling from the court today. And it was a decisive loss from Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. The court rejected the Georgia Republicans case, trying to overturn the hefty fine she incurred for repeatedly refusing to wear a mask on the House floor during the pandemic. That's right. Marjorie Taylor Greene took her COVID conspiracies all the way to the highest court in the land. Of course she did. You may remember Congresswoman Greene and some of her MAGA colleagues flouted the rules over and over and over again, even while sheltering in place during the January 6th insurrection, by the way as thousands of people died of COVID every day across the country. Marjorie Taylor Greene boasted about her total disregard for others' health and safety. I refuse to wear a mask. And Chris, oh. I have to tell you something else. I'm not vaccinated. And I will be standing strong, standing up for the people across this country that refuse to get vaccinated. Eventually, it caught up with her, financially. 
As The Hill notes, House rules fine lawmakers $500 for their first infraction with the mask mandate and $2,500 for subsequent breaches. The second one really hurts to be withdrawn from their yearly pay. Green racked up more than a hundred thousand dollars in fines. That's a lot of times refusing to wear a mask. That is also well over half of her annual salary. So the Congresswoman and two of her colleagues, Thomas Massey of Kentucky and Ralph Norman of South Carolina, brought a lawsuit. Of course they did against then Speaker Nancy Pelosi and other House staffers. They argued basically that the fines amounted to an illegal reduction of their salary. They lost in front of the district court, again at the U.S. Court of Appeals, and now the Supreme Court has refused the case altogether, allowing the lower court ruling to stand. So, as it turns out, the rules apply to you too, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mask up or pay up.